Good morning and welcome to divine service on the feast of Saint Michael and all holy angels. Uh, today the focus is on the heavenly angels. Well, I shouldn't say the focus is on them, but we consider the heavenly angels and how our Savior uh, guards his promises to us by making use of his holy angels which guard and protect us and minister to us the recipients of Christ's salvation. Uh, we trust that our holy angels are guarding and protecting our brothers and sisters who are not able to be with us today for whatever reason. Our opening hymn is Ye Watchers and Ye Holy Ones, hymn 475.
will confess my transgressions unto the Lord.
in the glory of God the Father. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O everlasting God, who hast ordained and constituted the service of angels and men in a wonderful order, mercifully grant that as thy holy angels always do thee service in heaven, so by thine appointment they may succor and defend us on earth. Through Jesus Christ, thy Son, our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee and the Holy Ghost, ever one God, world without end. Amen. Please be seated. The Old Testament lesson appointed for reading on this, the Feast of St. Michael, is recorded for us in the book of Genesis, chapter 28, verses 10 through 22. This is the word of the Lord. Let us sit attentively to receive it. Jacob went out from Beersheba and went to, toward Haran. So he came to a certain place and stayed there all night because the sun had set. And he took one of the stones of that place and put it at his head, and he lay down in that place to sleep. Then he dreamed, and behold, a ladder was set up on the earth, and its top reached to heaven. And there the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord, God of Abraham your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie I will give to you and your descendants. Also your descendants shall be as the dust of the earth. You shall spread abroad to the west and the east, to the north and the south. And in you and in your seed all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land for I will not leave you until I have done what I have spoken to you. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, How awesome is this place! This is none other than the house of God, and this the gate of heaven. Then Jacob rose early in the morning, and took the stone that he had put at his head, set it up as a pillar, and poured oil on top of it. Then he called the name of that place Bethel, but the name of the city had been loosed previously. Then Jacob made a vow, saying, If God will be with me, and keep me in this way that I am going, and give me bread to eat, and clothing to put on, so that I come back to my father's house in peace, then the Lord shall be my God. And this stone, which I have set up as a pillar, shall be God's house. And of all that you give me, I will surely give a tenth to you. Here ends the lesson. We read responsively Psalm 34 as printed in the bulletin. I will bless the Lord at all times. My soul shall make its boast in the Lord. O magnify the Lord with me. I sought the Lord, and he heard me. They looked to him and were radiant. This poor man cried out, and the Lord heard him. The angel of the Lord encamps around all those who fear him. O taste and see that the Lord is good. O fear the Lord, you his saints. The young lions lack and suffer hunger. Come, you children. 
children. Listen to me. Who is the man who desires life? Keep your tongue from evil. Depart from evil and do good. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. The face of the Lord is against those The Lord is near to those who have a broken heart. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. He guards all his bones. Evil shall slay the wicked. The Lord redeems the soul of his servants. The Holy Epistle appointed for this day is recorded for us in the book of Revelation, chapter 12, verses 7 through 12. Then a war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels had fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought, but they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old, called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren, who accused them before God day and night, has been cast down. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives to the death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and sea, for the devil has come down to you having great wrath, because he knows he has a short time. Here ends the Holy Epistle. God hath given his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Hallelujah, hallelujah. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Hallelujah.
Let us arise for the reading of the Holy Gospel recorded for us in the Gospel according to St. Matthew, beginning in chapter 18 at the first verse. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus, saying, Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Then Jesus called a little child to him and set him in the midst of them and said, Assuredly, I say to you, unless you are converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever receives one little child like this in my name receives me. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were drowned in the depth of the sea. Woe to the world because of offenses, for offenses must come. But woe to that man by whom offenses come. If your hand or your foot causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you. It is better for you to enter life lame or maimed rather than having two hands or two feet to be cast into everlasting fire. And if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you. It is better for you to enter life with one eye rather than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire. Take heed that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I say to you that in heaven their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. For the Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. Here ends the Holy Gospel.
your fellow redeemed by the blood of the spotless Lamb of God, hear once again the words of our Old Testament lesson recorded for us in Genesis 28, verses 10 through 22. Jacob went out from Beersheba and went toward Haran. So he came to a certain place and stayed there all night because the sun had set. And he took one of the stones of that place and put it at his head, and he lay down in that place to sleep. Then he dreamed, and behold, a ladder was set up on the earth, and its top reached to heaven. And there the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord, God of Abraham your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie I will give to you and your descendants. Also your descendants shall be as the dust of the earth. You shall spread abroad to the west and the east, to the north and the south. And in you and in your seed, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land. For I will not leave you until I have done what I have spoken to you. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, How awesome is this place. This is none other than the house of God, and this the gate of heaven. Then Jacob rose early in the morning and took the stone that he had put at his head and set it up as a pillar and poured oil on top of it. And he called the name of that place Bethel, but the name of that city had been Luz previously. Then Jacob made a vow saying, if God will be with me and keep me in this way that I am going and give me bread to eat and clothing to put on so that I come back to my father's house in peace, then the Lord shall be my God. And this stone which I have set up as a pillar shall be God's house. And of all that you give me, I will surely give a tenth to you. Here ends the lesson. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, make us holy in the truth. Your word is true. Amen. Oh God certainly knocks us down from time to time, doesn't he? Look at the disciples for a moment in the gospel lesson. They came to Jesus and asked him, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Just to ask the question. The implication is, look at us, look at how wonderful we are. Which of us who have left it all behind to follow you? Which of us is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And look at Jesus' words crushing they are to the ego unless you become converted you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven wow talk about being taken down a notch or two these who think they are something special are told you still need to be converted you need to become as children and the interesting thing is that we would sooner baptize a child who can't even talk yet than we would baptize an adult who still needs to be converted and become as a child to enter the kingdom of heaven. After hearing words like that, what is there possibly left of our pathetic egos, at least insofar as we stand before God? Or think about Jacob in our text. He had pulled the wool over his father's eyes, so to speak. Interestingly, he put wool on his arms to pass himself off as his brother. He lied blatantly to his father. Who are you? Oh, I'm your son Esau. Well, the voice is Jacob. Yet he affirmed, no, no. I am your older son. I am Esau. Not only did he blatantly lie to his father and steal what rightly belonged to his older brother, but he broke the commandment against adultery by weakening the marriage of his parents, pitting his mother against his father. And while back in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve were deceived, here in this account, Jacob and his mother are the deceivers. Yes, but 
But there was a prophecy spoken about Jacob, yes. And the prophecy is specifically this. The older will serve the younger. His mother was told that she had two kingdoms wrestling within her. And the older would serve the younger. Now, God would carry that out no matter what, to be sure. And there are those who have written very well-known theologians who have suggested that this might in fact be a righteous thing that Jacob and his mother did. I don't know. God really never is the author of sin, is he? And God could certainly have intervened. He could have made it so that Esau got his game and got back so fast that Jacob never had a chance to carry it out. But God allows it to unfold as it unfolds. And I'm sure there was purpose in that. Jacob, going through events as they were unfolding, couldn't even begin to know God's hand in things, and neither can you, neither can I. Jacob got his brother so angry that his brother vowed to kill him. So mom went to dad and said, I don't want my son marrying one of the women in this area. Send him back to my family to make an excuse for Jacob to leave home and go someplace safe until his brother cooled down a little bit. So there Jacob was, out in the middle of nowhere. The sun was setting. He laid down to sleep, placed a stone at his head. There he was, facing the hard consequences of his actions, the hard consequences of his sin. And God granted him a dream. When we look at dreams in the scriptures, very few people are ever recorded as having dreams that were meaningful. Yet we all like to think that we are somehow so special that we are going to have special dreams that have special meaning. Almost like the disciples, right? Who is the greatest? Who is the one who's going to be given the special revelation? Very few have dreams. And in Ecclesiastes, it's quipped that the dreaming of a dream comes with a whole lot of effort. You can think about what that's about. But Jacob was special for a number of reasons. He was special because he was born to someone God had made a very direct promise. He was special because in the scheme of things, God actually had chosen Jacob. He rejected his brother Esau as being the one in the direct line of our Savior and chose Jacob for that line instead. He was special. He was also special because he was a liar who came from a long line of liar. If you read the history of the patriarchs, it's liar, liar, liar. Oh boy. In any case, he was granted the dream and he saw a ladder set up on earth the ladder stretched into the heavens, and the angels, the messengers of God, ascended and descended on that ladder, and God himself stood at the top of it and proclaimed to Jacob who he is and made a promise to Jacob. Now, many people misunderstand the ladder. They view the ladder as a way that we, by what we do, might, in fact, climb up into the heavens, but there is no indication of that at all. Jacob is never told, start climbing. Jacob is never told, the ladder represents your works and each rung of a good work raises you up closer to heaven. Not at all. If you can accept it, that ladder that was set up on the earth in Jacob's dream was none other than our Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus indicated as much to his disciples in his ministry on earth, when he told them the day is coming when you will see the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man, upon Jesus himself. And there, there he called their memory back to the days 
when Jacob, by his own shenanigans and sin, ended up running away from home, estranged from his family in a foreign land, at least a land that was foreign to himself, out in the wilderness, on the hard ground, with a stone at his head, facing the hard consequences of who he is and what he had done. And he heard a beautiful promise. In you and in your seed to come, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. And I will be with you. I will truly not leave you until I have accomplished what I promised to accomplish. And there were the angels ascending and descending on the ladder to heaven, on the one who is the way to the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ himself. The holy angels there who ascend and descend by him. Jacob heard no command or promise to pray to the angels directly. No, instead, instead his attention is directed to the one on whom the angels ascend and descend. So it is that you and I face the hard consequences of our own sin from time to time. Now don't get me wrong. You're good people. You are. You're not sitting in a prison cell today for crimes that you have committed. Hopefully you are not even running away from your family for things that you have done in rivalry. And the thought of rivalry occurs over and over today. The disciples had a rivalry among themselves. Who is the greatest? Jacob had rivalry with his brother, wanting what didn't at least, in human terms, rightfully belong to him. You and I end up with rivalry, the people around us, even the members of the body of Christ in the pew along with us. We have rivalry with this political conviction or that political conviction. And we say and we do things and we think of ourselves in a certain way that even though we're pretty good people, when we look at ourselves in regard to God's standard of perfection and humility, if we're honest, we don't measure up. And oftentimes, when we think we're doing the right thing, it ends up that we face hard consequences for what we have done. And we find ourselves out there somewhere, whatever out there might mean, with a rock at our head and the hard ground beneath our back. Sometimes it seems that every time we almost have it together, that we're finally standing up, we're finally going to ma make it, bam, God kicks the feet out from under us once again. And we hear ourselves crying out almost like Esau before our account. Me too, Father. Bless me too. Do you not have a blessing also for me? crying out in anguish, laid low the consequence for who we are and what we have done. But we too hear a promise, just like Jacob heard a promise. We too understand that our Savior, who won salvation for us, is going to come back for us. He will return us in peace to our Heavenly Father, all of the rivalry taken away. Look at Jacob as the account unfolds. Look at what he says. If God will be with me, and, and don't understand this as some sort of, well, let's wait and see what happens, and I'll, I'll see if God's going to be my God, but rather understand the exuberance with which he speaks. He holds no idea that God is going to fail. That, that never comes to mind. He is simply stating a fact. If God will be with me and give me clothing, food, and shelter on my way and return me to my father's house in peace, look what he longs for now. He's heard the promise of God. He's seen the angels there indicating that God is absolutely capable of carrying out his promise, the one who is Lord of Sabaoth, of angel armies, of heavenly hosts is more than capable of making good on his promise. And look now 
at what Jacob seeks, not the better part of the inheritance, not the greater blessing, but clothing, food, and shelter, and above all, peace in the family. Now the whole attitude has changed. And that isn't to say that Jacob going forward didn't struggle with his pumped up ego. I think as we continue to follow his life story, we see his ego coming up again and again. But down the road, when God was indeed returning him in peace, and Jacob again was all alone out there in the wilderness, when all of his belongings and all of his family and all of his servants had, had been sent over the creek, Jacob was left alone. And Christ attacked him and wrestled with him all night long. And when Jacob demanded a blessing before he would let Christ go, the thief angel of the Lord go. Christ asked him, what is your name? Wow. If it were me, I'm pretty convinced that being faced with my grossest sin in life, I suspect I would have let go. But by God's grace, Jacob didn't let go. This time, hearing the echo of his father in his head. Yeah, you want a blessing, then tell me your name. Oh, my. And look at what he says this time. This time, he's not claiming to be somebody else. This time, he claims to be exactly who he is. I am the one whose very name means deceiver, the one whose brother declared to his father, isn't my brother rightly named Jacob, for he has deceived me these two times. Jacob, he grasps the heel. He is the one who pulls the leg and tries to climb up over the other to a position that, humanly speaking, doesn't belong to him. That's, that's who I am. I'm the liar. Oh, well. Oh, okay. Since that's who you are, you won't be called that anymore. Now you will be called Israel. Strength with God. Because you have contended with God and man and have overcome. So have you. When you stood today and confessed exactly what God says about you, you claimed your name. Sinner. Unclean. In thought, word, and deed. Not looking to the people around you and saying, well, I'm, I'm better than such and such a person. Not even daring to raise up your head and say, yes, but God, honestly, I've done all these good things. No. In contending for a blessing from God, you came clean and owned the name sinner, one who is not holy, one who is not pure. And you have received a new name. Back in the waters of baptism, which is what we turn to when we confess our sins and claim who we are by nature. Back in the waters of baptism, when we were clothed with Christ and adopted as a child of God, we received the family name of the Holy Triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we stand and are called by the world, not sinner. Christians, brothers and sisters of the Holy Ones. And so the human, all too human, angels of God, angel means messengers, stand for us as a symbol of the holy angels that are 
to serve us and guard and protect us. And in the gospel lesson, Jesus warms, warns those human angels, those messengers, those pastors of ours, that if they teach falsehood, speak falsehood to his dear children, he will take them to task for it and hold them accountable. And so they stand as symbols of the holy angels that God commands, who are always in the presence of God, so that when our, God, our needs are made known to God, he can, like that, cause them to help us. And those who speak God's word on his behalf, while the angels are there, listening in, and it is immediately recorded in heaven. And so the truth is spoken to those who own who they are, who can stand before God and say, it's true, I have made an absolute mess of my life. And I am in my very nature, sinful and unclean. The truth is spoken. Your sins are forgiven. And that is valid in heaven. And we know the promise that he who is powerful to deliver on his promises who said, I am coming back for you. Yes, he is. And he will not leave us, even as he said, till heaven and earth pass away. I will never leave you. I will be there with you and for you. And we have that confidence. And if all of that is not enough, then yes, today, he holds forth to us his very body and blood as a pledge that we may know, yes, yes, he who takes care of our greatest needs, feeding our faith that it may continue to grow and sustain us in this journey through the wilderness, will indeed take care of the clothing, food, and shelter issues as well. And he will, in fact, bring us in peace to our Father in heaven. Therefore, with angels, and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify the glorious name of God, evermore praising him, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of angel armies. Amen. Please allow. And now may the peace of God, which goes beyond all understanding, keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus.
Almighty and everlasting God, who art worthy to be had in reverence by all the children of men, we give thee most humble and hearty thanks for the innumerable blessings, both temporal and spiritual, which without any merit or worthiness on our part, thou hast bestowed upon us. We praise thee, especially that thou hast preserved unto us in their purity thy saving word and the sacred ordinances of thy house. And we beseech thee, O Lord, to preserve and extend thy kingdom of grace and to grant unto thy holy church throughout the world purity of doctrine and faithful pastors who shall preach thy word with power and help all who hear rightly to understand and truly to believe it. Send forth laborers into thy harvest and open the door of faith unto all the heathen and unto the people of Israel. In mercy, remember the enemies of thy church and grant unto them repentance unto life. Be thou the protector and defender of thy people in all time of tribulation and danger. And may we, in communion with thy church and in brotherly unity with all our fellow Christians, fight the good fight of faith and in the end receive the salvation of our souls. Bestow thy grace upon all the nations of the earth. Especially do we entreat thee to bless our land and all its inhabitants and all who are in authority. Cause thy glory to dwell among us and let mercy and truth, righteousness and peace everywhere prevail. To this end, we commend to thy care all our schools and pray thee to make them nurseries of youthful knowledge and Christian virtues, that they may bring forth the wholesome fruits of life. Graciously defend us from all calamities by fire and water, war and pestilence, from scarcity and famine. Protect and prosper everyone in his appropriate calling and cause all youthful arts to flourish among us. Be thou the God and father of the widow and the fatherless children, the helper of the sick and the needy, and the comforter of the forsaken and distressed. Accept, we beseech thee, our bodies and souls, our hearts and minds, our talents and powers together with the offerings we bring before thee, which is our reasonable service. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would bless all the people of the world who are suffering in any way from the calamities that have occurred recently. We pray that you, having the attention of the people of the world, would draw them to the only Savior of mankind, comfort with your holy gospel, and grant faith unto eternal life. We pray that you would motivate us to help where we are able. We also pray that you would continue to remember in your mercy your servant Dodi. Grant that as her ability to communicate her needs and thoughts to the people around her diminishes, that you would make the people around her that much more patient and eager to understand. Keep her and them in the true faith unto eternal life or grant faith among her helpers where it is lacking that together all of your people may glorify your holy name in eternity. And as we are strangers and pilgrims on earth, help us by true faith and a godly life to prepare for the world to come doing the work thou hast given us to do while it is day, before the night cometh when no man can work, and when our last hour shall come, support us by thy power, and receive us into thine everlasting kingdom, through Jesus Christ thy Son, our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee and the Holy Ghost, ever one God, world without end. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks unto the Lord our God. It is truly meet, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks unto thee, O Lord, Holy Father, almighty and everlasting God. But chiefly are we bound to praise thee for the glorious resurrection of thy Son, 
Jesus Christ, our Lord. For he is the very Paschal Lamb, which was offered for us, and hath taken away the sins of the world, who by his death hath destroyed death, and by his rising to life again, hath restored to us everlasting life. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify thy glorious name, evermore praising thee and saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. He gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, after supper he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the remission of sins. Do this as often as ye drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. O oh, oh, Christ, the Lamb of God, that take us the weight of sin and the
As often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, O God the Father, fount and source of all goodness, who in loving kindness did send thine only begotten Son into the flesh. We thank thee that for his sake thou hast given us pardon and peace in this sacrament, and we beseech thee not to forsake thy children, but evermore to rule our hearts and minds by thy Holy Spirit, that we may be enabled constantly to serve thee through Jesus Christ our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee and the Holy Ghost, ever one God, world with. 